here, uh, Megan's an environmental toxicologist with the water quality. Uh, Sean has been a toxicologist with the DNR for 20 years, monitoring, assessing the impacts of both legacy and emerging contaminants in fish and water or fish and wildlife resources. Okay, great. So can you see my presentation? We can, if you can bring it to full screen to start presentation. If you go back to end show there. And then from the beginning, that should bring you. Is that it? Not quite. Um, go down to the lower right hand corner if you'll see the little box on the stick. That's your Zoom. Uh, magnification tool here down to the lower right side of your screen it says notes and then like the fifth icon over i don't see it sorry <laughs> all right <Well. laughs> um derek if he's a uh got um, several screens he might be sharing the wrong screen when he goes to that okay yeah, we're seeing we're seeing your notes screen so we need to see your a slide presentation screen so if you want a slideshow that should bring up yep that's what i was on so okay and that won't do it huh just stick with us one minute here folks we'll get this Oh, and that again. We still got time here, so we're doing fine. So now, do you see on the bottom of your screen, the bottom bar where it says slide one of 26? Yep. Slide all the way to the right. You see that it says notes. And then, then oh, oh, right where you were, there's like a, looks like a T with a box on it. Are you seeing on the very bottom right side? Yeah, it's the icon right to the left of this little slide bar, the little slide zoom bar. Right there, hit that, that one right there, him. Okay, so we're still seeing your your notes slide. So end end the slideshow again. And I think if you go under under slideshow, um, let's see, there should be a. I think there's a icon somewhere where you can switch from presenter to notes. Um, use presenter view. There you go. Try that. There we go. All right. There we are. All right. Sorry about that. No problem. We have to have a little glitch once in a while. <laughs> so I'll just jump right in. Um, so Everybody in this audience is probably realizes how important and what a big tradition fishing is to the state of Wisconsin. And to parallel that, consuming the fish is also another great tradition. Um, there are numerous benefits to eating Wisconsin fish. Um, most people know that it's an income generator, so it supports the local economy. Um, it provides a cost efficient lean protein source. Um, and then there is also some significant nutritional benefits. Primarily, uh, fish are a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, specifically, the long chain omega-3s are especially beneficial. They are obtained through the diet. Uh, they are found uh, in seafood and they're important for both heart health and they're also very important to brain and eye development in babies. 
However, as with many things, there are benefits and risks to consuming fish, which brings us to the fish contaminants monitoring program within the Wisconsin DNR. So Wisconsin DNR has been testing fish for contaminants going back to the early 1970s. The primary focus is on popular lakes and rivers, and especially ones that are um, around industrial centers. Uh, we've tested fish from over 1,700 sites so far. And of all of our lakes and river miles, there are only about 150 specific locations that have site-specific consumption advisories that are due to either high mercury, PCBs, or PFOS. And we partner with the Department of Health Services in order to establish these consumption advisories and then also work with the US EPA and other Great Lakes states. Uh, Wisconsin is a member of the Great Lakes Consortium for Fish Advisories, which includes all the Great Lakes states, as well as Glyphwick and the province of Ontario. And we essentially just share information and try to develop best practices for establishing consumption advisories. <laughs> so we sample anywhere from 20 to 25 up to over 100 sites per year. The primary, primary contaminants are mercury and PCBs, but there are also a few sites where we still look at uh, chlorinated pesticides, um, such as DDT, then also um, dioxins and furans. And those are primarily sites on the Great Lakes, as well as, as the Wisconsin River. And we also look at emerging contaminants, um, and PFAS is one that's a growing concern and a priority. And I have emerging in quotation marks because um, the fisheries program and also the wildlife program have actually been looking at PFAS now um, going back to the early 2000s. And so um, it's been on our radar screen for quite a while. So I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time kind of discussing a couple of the legacy contaminants, mercury and PCBs, which drive many of our consumption advisories uh, for mercury. Um, the primary sources from industrial, industrial processes, uh, primarily coal-fired power plants, um, and the toxicology concerns for mercury are um, low-level long-term exposures, and the primary toxic endpoint for mercury is uh, the neural system, so neurologic toxicity. And for mercury, the highest risk is for women who are or plan to become pregnant or children under 15 years old. And mercury is found in all fish, regardless of location. But um, in Wisconsin, high concentrations tend to be found in fish from some northern lakes. And this is actually more of a reflection of water chemistry more than anything else. Certain lakes just have the conditions um, where elemental or inorganic mercury is transformed into methyl mercury, which is the form that is most toxic and also most bioaccumulative. Um, mercury is found and accumulates in the muscle tissue. So you cannot prepare your fish or clean it or cook it in a way that would reduce mercury concentrations. And in addition to human health, mercury is also a significant concern for piscivorous wildlife, primarily bald eagles, river otter, and common loons. We've done a lot of work um, examining the risk of mercury to these species. So this is just a statewide uh, graphic of fish mercury concentrations. And what I want you to make note of are the, the, the species that are on the far right. And so uh, for mercury, the, the, the species that accumulate the most are what we refer to as predator species. So bass, northern pike, walleye, muskie. Consistently, these species have um, the highest levels of mercury. And that's just something to um, keep in the back of your mind um, when I start to talk about PFAS in a few slides. Uh, switching quickly to uh, PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls. These are man-made compounds, they're very persistent. They were used in a wide variety of industrial processes until they were banned in the late 1970s. They are primarily associated with industrialized river systems in the Great Lakes. We do not detect 
uh, PC, PCBs very often in inland lakes unless if there is a known uh, source. Um, unlike mercury, PCBs build up in fat tissue. So fattier species contain more than leaner species and usually the bottom dwelling species contain more than fish that live higher in the water column because they live closer to the sediments where um, the PCBs are, are, are derived and are, are accumulate. Um, similar to mercury, uh, PCBs, the, the health effects are in regards to low level long-term exposure. So um, developmental delays in children, um, reproductive toxicity, there's the cancer risk, um, immunotoxicity, and the concern with PCBs is that it is, a, it is a risk for everyone. So we do not have age categories for PCBs. It's just that the, the criteria is, is for everyone. Um, the one thing with PCBs is that since they do accumulate in fat, there are ways to reduce your exposure, um, cut away all the belly fat, and then um, use a cooking method that allows the fat to drip away and don't use the drippings for anything. Um, and so that can significantly decrease the amount of PCBs in your fish. And this graphic just shows PCB levels in Lake Michigan salmonid species going back to the 1970s. And you can see soon after PCBs were, were banned, the levels are still pretty high, but there was a pretty quick decline. And that decline has continued um, to the present day, um, we still detect PCBs in pretty much all Lake Michigan fish, um, but it is declining, but that rate of decline has been uh, decreasing a little bit. So they're decreasing, but just not as sharply as what they have in the past. So switching to, to PFAS, um, Megan gave a really good introduction to, to PFAS, so I'm not going to go into the, the details too much, but they're pretty much found in a wide array of consumer products from fast food packaging to uh, raincoats, to frying pans, to firefighting foam. The health impacts for PFAS exposure, the primary ones are there, there's a relationship between PFAS exposure and cholesterol levels. Um, there's immune concerns, um, thyroid, disease is another uh, noted toxic endpoints, as well as um, hypertension and decreased fertility in women. And PFOS, PFOS, is the most bioaccumulative and, tox and toxic of all the PFAS compounds. And so pretty much all of our endpoints are based on PFOS. And similar to mercury, PFOS accumulates in the muscle tissue. It has a high affinity for proteins. And so there's really nothing you can do to either clean your fish or cook your fish in a certain way that would decrease um, the amount or decrease your exposure. And so this is a statewide graphic of fish PFOS levels. And if you remember back to the mercury graphic, um, you saw that the predatory species had the highest levels of mercury. Well, PFOS, are, the accumulation patterns are a little bit different where you can see we have species like white bass and crappie and bluegill and rainbow smelt, which we just issued a consumption advisory for in, in Lake Superior uh, just a few months ago. Um, so you can see the PFOS accumulation patterns in fish are quite a bit different where um, some species of fish that did not typically accumulate high levels of mercury and PCBs do actually accumulate quite high levels of PFOS. And we don't know why. This is an area of growing interest. There's a lot of, of, of folks and entities that are looking into this issue, but we don't have any real concrete ideas as to, as to why. Um, predatory species can st still accumulate high levels. It's just that these panfish species seem to accumulate PFOS at a higher rate or higher levels compared to mercury or PCBs. So we do have several locations where we do, uh, in the state, there are PFOS-based consumption advisories. <clears throat> the Mississippi River is one, and actually we've had PFOS-based consumption advisories in the upper pools of Mississippi River, so pools three, four, 
five and six for quite a while. And more recently, um, Lake Monona and Starkweather Creek near Madison, um, the Lake Superior Smelt, which is a new advisory, as well as certain impoundments on the Wisconsin River, the Barren Flowage and the Petenwell Flowage. Um, PFAS levels have been detected in fish from many other locations, but the levels are not high enough to overrule or supersede advisories that are already in place for um, PCBs or mercury. And so another way of putting it is that the existing P advisories for PCBs and mercury um, generate a more restrictive advice. And so I want to uh, point out that inset map of the Wisconsin River there, because um, I'm just going to diverge a little bit and talk a little bit about um, bald eagle PFAS. Um, so we have, the department has looked at PFAS in bald eagle populations going back to 2011. And uh, that state map there, you have the kind of the bright blue uh, dots that represent uh, the middle of the Wisconsin River. And we noticed the highest levels in eagles in this area. And so these high levels in eagles were also reflected in high levels in fish. So as I just mentioned, we have those consumption advisories for the impoundments of the, the Wisconsin River in the middle part of the state. In terms of the interpretation of the bald eagle results, the mean values are below uh, these av the avian PFOS toxic benchmark of uh, one part per million. However, I will say that that benchmark is under um, a little bit of review. Um, there's some that believe that that is a little bit too high and that actual benchmark should be lower. And just to peel back the onion, the onion peel a little bit more, to, um, while the mean values do not approach that benchmark, there are individuals that do push that toxic benchmark. So while the mean levels do not, there are certainly individuals that may be experiencing some toxic endpoints due to PFAS exposure. And just to uh, discuss a little bit or list some of the other emerging contaminants that we've detected in eagles, um, bisphenol A, um, these phthalates, the monobutyl phthalate that I have bolded there um, is one that we, detect, we detected on a regular basis. Um, it's a, a metabolic or a breakdown product of dibutyl phthalate, which is used as um, many different processes, but primarily as a plasticizer. And then also triclosan and tri triclocarban were also a couple other compounds that we de detected occasionally in eagle plasma. So dovetailing back around to uh, fish consumption advisories, um, how can you eat fish but reduce your exposure to contaminants? Well, um, consumption advice um, in Wisconsin fish is for everyone and everywhere. So I get asked a lot, um, does my lake or does my river have a consumption advisory? And the answer is yes. All water bodies in Wisconsin have some sort of a consumption advisory. If they don't have a site-specific advisory, they would fall under our what we refer to as our general or our um, statewide guidelines. And these can be found in our, on our website. Um, but these are primarily based on, on mercury levels. And so these are the default. And so if there isn't a site-specific advisory, these general advisories would be in place for that specific body of water. And we, we produce a book um, nearly every year. It's called our Choose Wisely. And this includes our state, statewide safe eating guidance, as well as some purchased fish guidance, and then guidelines for eating fish caught in the Great Lakes. And then it also lists all of the site-specific uh, conception advisories for inland waters that uh, are based on either mercury, PCBs, or PFOS. Um, our website, again, has a lot of useful information. You can just type in the, the search term, eating your catch, and you'll find um, links to our advisory reports and FAQs. And we also have an interactive query tool that allows you to find advice for eating fish from any water body in the state. And it is also mobile friendly, so you can 
um, look it up on your phone or tablet. So in summary, um, there's benefits and risks to consider when consuming Wisconsin fish. Uh, the DNR and Department of Health Services provide resources to help maximize the benefits while reducing the risks of eating Wisconsin fish. Um, Wisconsin fish can be safely incorporated into everyone's diet. And the most important rule is to simply follow the fish consumption advisories that are, have been put into place. And with that, I know I went, went fast, but I um, want to leave some time for questions. And so that, that's, that's it. All right, thank you, Sean. And we do have a few minutes for questions. We probably can take a couple extras um, just with the buffer time we have. As a reminder, you can go on the uh, event Mobi page, click on the session and click right on the person's or presenter's name and send them a message directly. We wanna be interactive with this conference still. So feel free to reach out directly. Um, I'm gonna try to address some of the questions that are kind of a, a broader audience here. So, Sean, how does the age of the fish impact the amount of PFOS in the species? Sure, there has not been any uh, documented relationships between either age or size of the fish. And so unlike mercury or PCBs that may or may not have a size relationship, that has not been um, identified for PFOS. And how do you determine which contaminates to monitor and how are new emerging contaminants introduced into the monitoring program? Sure, so essentially mercury is tested at, at all of our locations simply because that's considered a statewide, um, a statewide contaminant. Um, then depending on lo specific location, we'll determine whether or not PCBs are included. And since about 2017, 2018, we've essentially included PFOS into all of our contaminant monitoring, and we'll probably continue doing so until we have a better idea of what our statewide levels are in fish. And are the PFOS sampling results available on the website for both uh, eagles and fish? We do not post the raw data. Um, our summary materials are, um, on, are on the website. Um, there have, there have been some individual reports that are on our website as well, but we normally do not post um, strictly raw data. And then some people had asked about from previous presentations linked to SWIMS data and our studio data. I did stick that into the event Moby chat. Um, so you can go directly in that and go back to the previous sessions also and get that link or else contact. Um, I think that came from Kathy, so you click contact her directly if you want links for that. Otherwise, these presentations will be uh, posted later. You can go back to those presentations. Um, uh, Sean, can you briefly describe the difference between PFOS and PFOS, PFAS? Sure, so PFOS, P-F-O-S is a PFAS. So PFAS is kind of an umbrella term that includes hundreds if not thousands of different compounds and PFOS, so PFOS is simply one of those, uh, one of those PFAS compounds. So it's um, just a specific chemical perfluoroctane sulfonate that falls under the per and polyfluoroalkylated substances category. And uh, is there any specific outreach to some of the substance, subsistence uh, fishing cultures, such as the Hmong community in the state? Yes. So our um, advisory materials are translated in the Hmong, and uh, the Department of Health Services actually does quite a bit of outreach to um, subsistence uh, subsistence anglers. And I think this question is. I think this was from Kathy. Um, what is the 2020 Wiscom Aquatic Life Criteria and where can you find this? Okay, so the um, 2020 Wiscom Criteria is posted online. The easiest way to find it is to just look up um, impaired waters on the DNR website. And um, I think the link to the Wiscom Criteria is right there. Um, but so for example, for total phosphorus, um, they list the aquatic life and recreation criteria together. So for both aquatic life 
and recreation for total phosphorus, um, they have the same uh, number, I guess if that makes sense. Um, so that, that's posted on the DNR website. Otherwise, um, I'd be happy to email it to anyone. And I will mention too, I think there is already perhaps a 2022 version out there, but I haven't seen it yet. And then there's several questions kind of regarding how do we get testing uh, going on our lakes as far as um, just baseline water testing, uh, concerns about runoff from both uh, waste spreading from uh, septic haulers and farmers, and what's the starting point for getting some of this testing going, would you guys suggest? I can jump in there. Um, so if they're concerned about uh, runoff, um, probably checking with the uh, citizen lake monitoring or the WAVE program, if they're interested in volunteering to collect the data would be a good start. They're not always able to give you the, um, the funds to process phosphorus and chlorophyll A um, tests right away, but uh, sometimes if there's a significant concern, they might. And then also I'd also throw in there, you know, contact all your different resources, your local county resources like Kathy works for, your DNR resources, and there's several different bureaus that may be um, applicable. So through the Lakes Monitoring Program, through the Nonpoint Program, you know, just reach out there. There's a lot of good people and good staff that have been around a long time and can get you to the right uh, location. And then we'll do one last question here. Are all contaminants human made or do you monitor for any natural contaminants? I think this was toward Sean's presentation. Well, I, I, I guess I would say that mercury is a natural contaminant. I mean, it's an element. Um, it comes primarily from anthropogenic sources, um, but that is probably the only um, natural, in quotes, contaminant that we test for. We, we don't usually test for, for heavy metals, other heavy metals, unless there is a uh, concern or a source. All right, and with that, we're a few minutes past our time. The next session start at 10 o'clock. So again, reach out directly to any of our presenters and thank you to Kathy, Megan, and Sean for putting everything together for us.